Is it okay if I set up here, or do they usually try to set up here? Whatever you, works for you. But oh, you could probably you could probably ask them to slide around if that's what, the reason. I just don't want I like you sitting up close, though. Yeah. <laughs> With bananas, no less. I'm going to be like hungry for a banana the entire lecture. Pretty close to time, so I, I want to get the splitter at least so that I can uh, feel like my laptop plugged in. This one? Yep. Oh, I shoot, I forgot to order the new one. It's all connected right now, we just connected it, so. Uh, here. This is for you to plug in this one? Okay. Oh uh, no, this is what's on my computer. <laughs> I guess I'm still in the bag. Goes to me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this goes to the to, from the floor to you. This is not plugged in, that's probably the reason. Go ahead and plug that in somewhere over here. <laughs> yep. And then I will go ahead and start.
is this supposed to, you know, this is a... Uh, one goes to the camcorder, one's the microphone, and one goes... I don't know for sure. Sorry. I feel we're, we're I, need to, I need to start, so I'm going to let you catch up, okay? Okay, welcome back. So last time we transitioned from dynamic programming's view of the world to the Lyapunov view of the world. And we did some of the initial exercises just to get you familiar with Lyapunov functions and the mechanics of taking gradients and making sure the gradients are less than zero. So I'll start just with a quick recap again. But the goal for today is to start introducing more of the computational approaches to Lyapunov functions. And this is going to be where we're going to introduce more powerful optimization. So I'll even stop and uh, do just a, a little bit of introduction on optimization and point you to more resources online for, for things that I can't cover. OK, let's, um, let's begin. So you'll remember now that I said a, a number of times is that if we have an optimal control, this is sort of my recap. Look at the nice clean boards. Good day. OK. Um, the, the optimal control dynamic programming view of the world was I'm minimizing some cost to go. It could be an integral or some, depending on if it's a discrete or continuous time. Right? Um, <clears throat> Maybe I'll, I'll stick with continuous time first since I've written that more. I have some cost function. That we've been taping it typically over an infinite horizon like this with some dynamics. And we've been working with the Lyapunov, or with the cost to go function, j star of x, which <clears throat> we saw two versions of it. We saw the, um, the conditions for continuous time looked like this. And the, just, we had a discrete time version of that too. Right. And the implication was that dj dt has to be going downhill at exactly, if you're, implement, if you're executing the optimal policy, then that means your cost to go must be going downhill at exactly the rate of the loss when you're taking the optimal controller. Right. This was the sort of analysis of that equation. And what we did with the Lyapunov was to relax that, right? Instead of finding a j that's going downhill at exactly this rate, there's a lot of interesting things you can say if you can just find a function v of x positive definite such that dv dt is just going downhill at all, right? So you should think of this as similar to a cost to go in the sense that it's trying to tell you which way to go to accomplish the task. But instead of saying exactly the rate or you know, make, guaranteeing you're going to have an optimal path to it, it's just saying if you go downhill, you'll get there eventually. Right? So if you if, remember the first example I gave for the dynamic programming was actually on a grid. It was the grid world. And we saw the value function as a picture, uh, you know, a, a contour on the grid. And we computed the optimal cost to go with dynamic programming. Okay. You could imagine doing a Lyapunov analysis on the grid, too. That would be any function, which if I go downhill, I will eventually get to the goal. Right? So it's, there's many possible Lyapunov functions. And apart from up to a, adding a scalar, constant scalar, this is a unique, there's a unique cost to go function. This is going to be easier to search over this. And you can search over, like, it, there's cases where, for instance, the 
cost to go might be a really ugly function. Even simple cases, we know it's an ugly function. It could be discontinuous. The minimum time problems are discontinuous, or non-smooth at least. They might be polynomial of degree, I don't know, 4 million or something like that, okay? And, but often you can find like a degree 3 Lyapunov function that would still certify that you'll get there eventually, right? So there's more functions that will satisfy this inequality constraint, and because of that, it's going to be easier to search over them. Okay, so that's the high-level idea. And sort of my promise to you today is that we start digging into what, what is the computational leverage we have once we switch to that inequality. So to preview the results, let me just give an example of kind of what we'll work back up to. This is, um, make it nice and big here, a simple example of um, taking the equations of motion of the pendulum. I can make it even bigger here. Okay. And we, I introduced, I motivated Lyapunov functions by saying that um, you know, a mechanical energy for, a, for the damp pendulum is actually a pretty good Lyapunov function. Okay? But that required our insights and our knowledge of mechanics to, to, to do that. Wouldn't it be cool, wouldn't it be impressive if, uh, if I just gave the equations of the pendulum and a solver could automatically discover mechanical energy? Right? If you think about it, you've been working on your value iteration codes, right? And it takes a lot of com compute to sort of find something that looks like a solution to the, the pendulum, right? So it'd be pretty cool if it came out with just the exact equations of the, of the of energy automatically. And it, you know, it will do almost that up to some, so I will, we will understand exactly how the code works as we go, f go along, but let me just run it right now, okay? And this is the contour plot, so the eyeball of the, of the pendulum. And I just asked it to find a Lyapunov function. I, I set a scaling just to make sure it came up with something that was zero at the origin and roughly the energy of, a mechanical, of, a, of the pendulum. That was the only knowledge I inserted. Otherwise, I just put the equations of motion in and I said, find me a Lyapunov function. And the Lyapunov function, um, it looks like is the con dark contour lines. The dashed contour lines are the true mechanical energy. Okay, and if you even look at the I have a LaTeX printout from uh, Jupiter, so this is actually the output of the code generated these LaTeX equations. The true energy of the pendulum looks like this with the, whatever, with the numbers of the pendulum I had. This is the ML squared, it turns out to be 0.125, and that's, uh, you know, MGL turns out to be 0.49 or whatever, one minus cosine. And the thing it found is this, I just gave it a, 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 a bigger function class to search over, said find me some, a function that, that satisfies that. And if you look, it's actually almost identically this, the, the energy, okay? Why? So there's, a, there's actually a cosine squared plus sine squared. You know, my notation C is, is for a shorthand for sine of, uh, S is for sine and C for cosine. So this is actually sine squared plus cosine squared. It's like almost one. If I were to add this as a one here, I'd get my 0.495. Um, I get my 0.125 theta dot squared. It's almost exactly the energy. As the contour plot reveals, it's almost exactly the energy. But it's not quite the energy. It has this small off term, and it's actually better than the energy. Because the energy, remember, we needed an extra argument, the Lassalle's invariance principle, to actually say that it was asymptotically stable. Right? We had to do that extra work, saying, well, okay, well, theta dot is zero, which means energy dot is zero at some points, but I can still construct. This one actually is asymptotically stable out of the box. It did better than the mechanical energy. Yeah? Are you uh, sort of copying it modulo 2 pi per image uh, for across the width of the graph? I, in the plotting, yes. Yeah, but it's because the, the function has actually got sines and cosines. So I'm not, I'm not doing any modulo. It's just... Oh. Those are sines and cosines in there, yeah. I'm just evaluating the sine and cosine. Okay, so that's like what we want to work back up to. And by the way, that happened instantly. There's no value iteration updates or whatever. That was solving a convex optimization, which we'll try to talk a bit more about today, right? And um, it's good. It's good, okay. So let's try to understand more of that.
but hopefully the motivation is sort of clear that we're going to try to come up with these cost to go functions, like functions, but now Lyapunov functions, with computation, right? So I put in the equations, and it had to cover, come up with this. Same thing we did for, for cost to go, but for Lyapunov it's easier. So just because, um, so I'm gonna, this is also gonna, like I said, I'm gonna use more advanced optimization tools today. And um, you know, there's, there's some call outs in the notes. I, we even have a, we gave a recitation last year that is recorded on YouTube. So if there's a kind of a background recitation on, opti on convex optimization if you haven't seen it. So let me just say like a, a little bit about it just to get through the lecture. But if you need more, uh, we've got more resources. So let me just give sort of an optimization crash, crash course. So we've been doing optimization already, but we're going to do more structured versions of it today. So, you know, the general form here is I'm saying minimize some function f of x, right? These are my decision variables. This is my objective. And I might say subject to some constraints, maybe a, a generic way to write that would just be to say g of x is less than or equal to zero, and maybe I have lots of constraints, okay? Only one objective. This is a scalar objective. The constraints can potentially be vector constraints like that. Okay, and in general, this is an arbitrarily interesting sort of function. Right, it might do all sorts of interesting things. It might not even be continuous, right? Um, somewhere in this landscape is some minimizing value, which I've been calling x star for the optimal solution, if I'm trying to minimize the objective. The constraints on this picture will look like, you know, there's some parts of x that are valid and some that are not valid. So the constraints will sort of restrict the domain of my search to some subset of the, of the decision variables x. Okay, so if I had some different constraints, I need more colors. Let's say I had a constraint that said x has got to be in here. Well, then now the optimal solution is, is here, right? But if the if there's you know if the constraints contain this lower this lower value, then of course that would be the optimal solution. Okay, so this is a super powerful language. It's the language of machine learning. It's the language of optimization. It's the language of, of reinforcement learning, of course. <clears throat> but in um, in this class, we're going to lean more on some structured versions of it rather than doing gradient descent, which we can do on almost any f. We're going to look at special cases where f is a nice function and think about ways that we can make f and g nice functions. Okay, so we've already seen examples of nice versions of optimization, right? We've seen cases where if f of x was a quadratic, for instance, right? And that's a particularly nice landscape, right, where it's easy to find a solution at the, at the optimal solution. And it turns out if I have, um, you know, the, the property that makes this nice, of course, is that it's a convex function, right? This is a convex function. Similarly, if G are convex, describe a convex set, right? If the elements, if the total constraints G define some set of X, if I were to draw let's say looking down from above, X1 and X2, I have two decision variables. If my constraints might be, for instance, I don't know, I've got one constraint saying that you need to be on this side of the line, and another constraint saying you've got to be in this side of the line, and another constraint being this side of the line, then that makes some nice convex set. 
Okay. This is a convex constraints. When you're in the land of objective functions that are convex functions and constraints that form a convex set, then you're in the land of convex optimization, generally speaking. It actually takes more to be, one, to be a good convex optimization. You need to need, need to be able to find an initial member, and there's all these little subtle things that make it, make it good. But the high-level view is that if your objective function is convex and your constraints form a convex set, then you're in the land of convex optimization. And compared to a problem, an arbitrary problem like this, if you're in the land of convex optimization, we have very good solvers that you will expect to efficiently and normally robustly find the minimum if it exists. If there's no solution, it will tell you. It's a, it's a good class of optimization problems to work on. Okay. What's the problem here is if I, if I have an initial guess that's over here, I might walk down and think I'm at the minimum here even though the minimum was way down here. So there's a local minima problem in these, in these kind of um, more general situations, which are just not a problem here. So there's a zoo of convex optimization problems that you've heard me mention. We even kind of intentionally tossed one at you in one of the problem sets when we did the linear programming version of dynamic programming. Right? Again, that was a warm-up. We didn't ask you to think about the LP very much in that, but it was intended to, to make you aware. So you'll, you know, the zoo of, of um, <clears throat> convex optimization starts with sort of linear programming where you have a linear cost function and linear constraints. Right? If I have a minimize over x c transpose of x subject to ax less than or equal to b, then you're in the space of linear programming. And these are the most powerful, like the solvers that solve linear programming problems scale incredibly well, super robust. They're used in big industry problems and the like. Going up to the level of complexity, you get quadratic programming. Which is a quadratic objective. If Q is positive definite, then it's a convex quadratic program. But you still have linear constraints. And there's, there's more in this hierarchy, but there's only two more that we'll really use a lot. And actually, I'll even... So in the middle here is second-order cone programming. But I don't need that for today. And then what we'll start using today is also semi-definite programming. Which I'll, I guess I can say it now, right? So if I have some um, semi-definite constraint, a positive semi-definite constraint like this, a linear objective, potentially linear constraints. Let me, I want to write that in a way that looks a little better. I'll say minimize over x, c transpose x, ax less than or equal to b, and then I'll just write some p that's a function of x, a linear function of x is less than or equal to zero. This is a semi-definite constraint. OK. 
okay, that this is going to be a, an important class too, and I'll, I'll say more about it. Okay, so more structured than the general nonlinear programming are these linear programs, quadratic programs, semi-definite programs. You'll hear me say SDP for this. LP, QP, SDP. There's like, you know, semesters worth of things you could know about that, but I don't think you need to that any anything anywhere near that level to understand the tools we're going to talk about. Mostly, all you need to understand is how to use these, which is that if I were to open up mathematical programs, what we call it in Drake, and I say add constraint, add constraint, add cost. If I'm adding linear costs and linear constraint, linear costs and linear constraints, and I call solve it will solve it as a linear program. If I add quadratic constraints, it will solve it as a quadratic program. And it will do its best to keep you in this space, so in the, in the, using the best solvers that you can possibly use for that class of problems. Questions at that level? I know that's very high level. We're going to see some details about it today. That's just the context. How many people feel like they've seen, let's say, LP before, linear programs before? QPs? SOCPs? SDPs? Yeah, okay. That's, that's, uh, that's good. It went down. For those of you looking this way, it went down as I, as I went down the board, yeah, the number of hands. Okay, so let me, let's start by thinking, how could I possibly find a Lyapunov function for the pendulum? using something like that, one of these kind of solutions, like linear costs, linear constraints. How is that even going to possibly combat the nonlinearity of the pendulum? Okay. And the first version I'll do, which I think is easy to think about, is just a linear programming version of it. Got to mention the extra resources. So um, we do. So there's actually pretty good tutorials in the Drake tutorials about the different classes of linear programming, quadratic programming, and the like. Those are actually a reasonable place to look. Um, but also on the course syllabus, um, right? I put on the link in the reading material to. The, the recitation from last year, background recitation on convex optimization uh, with this here. So if you want to watch a you know, full-length recitation that goes, talks through that much more carefully, it's, it's there for you. And there's many more references that we can give to. Okay, so how can I possibly find a Lyapunov function um, with this kind of, these kind of tools? So let's do the, the pendulum example. So... Um, in this case, let's say the microphone's slipping off. I should wear a proper shirt. Okay. If I have my pendulum dynamics, ML squared theta double dot plus B theta dot plus M. I'll just say equals zero for now. For today, we're going to analyze the closed the the passive pendulum, then what I want to do is, is um, search over a class of possible functions that could be a Lyapunov function. Right? And the big idea here is that we're going to use linear function approximators which remember I said look like sum over i alpha i of some basis functions b of x, which you can also just write as a in the matrix form. And the 
the reason to like these um, linear function approximators as Lyapunov candidates is that V dot, the other conditions we want to check, right, which is partial V partial X F of X, is still linear in those same parameters, right? Because partial V partial X is just alpha transpose partial phi partial x f of x. OK? So the v dot form is also linear in these parameters. And the idea that I want to chase is that if I want to sample, if I want to evaluate this at a handful of, I mean, there's, there's nonlinearity in f. There's nonlinearity in the, even in the gradients of this. But if I were to sample a bunch of x positions, then the conditions I want to check as a function of alpha are actually simple. They're linear. OK? So the idea, first idea, sample many x i's. Find alpha so that for all i, v of xi greater than 0 and v dot of xi less than 0. And if xi is given, then this is linear constraint in alpha, linear constraint in alpha. Okay. And to make that concrete, for the pendulum, I chose V of x to be a basis of trigonometric polynomials, of, the, of these terms that I would expect to appear in the, in the function. So for an arbitrary system of this form, I would say that I'd expect to see um, you know, possibly a constant term. I'd probably see a cosine, maybe see cosine terms, maybe see sine terms theta dot, but then I also, a, a standard basis to choose for these, a polynomial or a trigonometric polynomial basis would be to take these variables and then start multiplying them by themselves to higher degrees, okay? So a standard recipe would, would include then, I'll also have cosine squared theta. I don't actually need sine squared theta because if I have one and cosine squared, then I'm good. I don't need the sine squared. I can leave that one off. But I'll have sine theta times cos theta, theta dot, sine theta. I'm just going to write all of them. It's, I'm not trying to um, give the algorithm sort of any hints to which ones are, are going to be important. I'll just pick a, a maximum degree. I could go up to degree three. I could go higher, OK? And I'll just list all of the polynomial bases. Yes? Is Uh, in fact, that's I did. I did it here. So the so the fact that I you know it came out with an extra coefficient and that I had to realize was um, you know was basically one. So so this is an example where I didn't take that care to leave it out. So it's I think it's only so the the question was that you know would it have hurt anything if I included sine squared, and the answer is no. It just would have given you multiple solutions that are equally as good. Okay, and then I wrote a linear program, okay, which I listed. There's a lot of constraints for every data point. I just made a grid over my state space, okay. For every point, I wrote a linear constraint. I evaluated. These are my fees. So there's a so the the function the v function is alpha one times you know, alpha one plus alpha two times cosine plus alpha three times sine plus you understand right, okay. Find me the alphas, the coefficients of these, of this polynomial, such that those conditions hold. The Lyapunov conditions hold at all the sample points. Okay, I, I actually impose less than or equal to because I want zero to be zero. Right. Every data point leads to a li two linear equations. 
to make sure, so there, there's a small subtlety about um, if you want to say that V of X I is actually like this, then what you can say, for instance, is you can say I, what I actually wrote in the code is that V of X I is greater than or equal to some small number, epsilon X I squared, like this, you know, X, X I transpose X I in the, in the matrix case. This is just like some 1e to the minus 3 or something I picked. It just says, you know, if I add this as a constraint, then that will give me a truly positive definite function, okay? And then the thing I said, I, I, I put one extra um, idea in. I just said that v at 0 is 0, v at 1 is 1, just so it doesn't like have an arbitrary choice of scaling. I just set some, I picked a random state and said this is the value here should be one. And I said this other the value at the other place should be zero. I put that into code. This other the value at the other place should be zero. I put that into code. Okay. That's my monomial basis. This a monomial being you know, a piece of a polynomial, right? So if I add them all together, I get a polynomial, but even if it's just one term, I, these are each monomials, okay? I just put those in just like this. I hand it to the solver, and it does exactly, it finds me coefficients. This is the true energy. This, this one's a slightly different example. This one only works at, at sample points, but because in this case I did leave out the sine squared, extra sine squared, I got exactly 4.905 here. Okay, and it matches very closely the true energy, but it has that extra, little extra term which makes it actually um, asymptotically stable. Yes? So, great. So the question is, have I actually proven anything, right? I found something that satis is satisfied at all the sample points, but who knows if I picked enough sample points, right? Um, and that's what the next part's going to all be about. It's going to take uh, we're going to it's going to take a semi-definite program instead of a linear program is the short is the is the short answer. But it, but it also takes some works to get back up there. Is that is that basic example clear? It sort of gives you a sense of how you could use optimization to find a Lyapunov. It's very similar. This is like almost identical to what you did in the LPDP problem, okay, where you were trying to find a cost to go function using these linear constraints. Yes? Since we're requiring sampling, presumably somewhat densely, do we get in trouble in high dimensional systems? Absolutely. You, this, would, this is going to run out of steam in high dimensions if you have to sample densely. Yeah. That's why we want to be able to have a for all x version. We didn't have a for all x version in dynamic programming, but we're going to be able to have one here. Not to say, yeah, probably it could, it's very hard to do it in, in the dynamic programming. Or the way we'll be able to approximately do it in dynamic programming is going to follow from what we do in the Lyapunov. Okay, so let's take that question right on. So how could I possibly, um, How could I possibly certify that that thing was actually, those the Apanov conditions were true for all x? Right, you guys understand the request, right? Is that we just said it at sample points. How could we do it for all x? Well, here's a sort of a halfway idea, but it'll prime the pump, if you will, right? What if I were to choose different basis functions? Okay, what if I were to choose instead? V of x equals sum over i alpha i times V i x squared. Remember, we kind of did that in the, in the energy argument, the energy shaping argument. We kept finding things and found ways to make everything squared. Because I know that's going to be positive. If I were to constrain now just alpha to be positive, right? then I could say that function is at least a positive definite function. Okay, that's a pretty good start. But is that still, you know, once I have v dot, then that's not gonna, 
necessarily be positive by construction. Okay, it turns out there's actually, this is a good class of functions to search over, but there's a better one. There's a generalization of this. Instead of writing, I mean, if I were to write this in the matrix form, you could say that this is alpha times Bx transpose uh, right, that's sort of the matrix form of what I what I wrote there. So let me, let me I'll put the alpha inside here. That looks a little bit more well. It's kind of like I put a diagonal matrix of alphas in here. It's kind of the way I would write that. And the better way to write it, which is I've almost done at this point, ge a nice generalization of that idea is write B transpose x times G of x, B of x, where, guess what? G is a positive definite, semi-definite matrix. If I can search for parameters here, that's kind of like my coefficients there, okay? But if as long as this matrix is positive definite or positive semi-definite, you get slightly different, you get different constraints, you get different, either your function is positive definite or positive semi-definite, okay? Then of course, if this is a matrix that's positive definite, anything I multiply, right, the, the rule, the definition of G being positive semi-definite says that for any X, you know, for all x. So certainly for phi of x, arbitrary phi of x, this thing is still going to be greater than or equal to zero. Right? That's just a strict generalization of that idea. Okay. The cool thing is we have ways to optimize over the positive semi-definite matrices. That's called semi-definite programming. And the key fact that makes that possible is that the set if you were to look at, if you were to take two semi-definite matrices, if I were to take the parameters, let's say G11 and G22 um, two, two or, or whatever, I've got some higher dimensional space and I have this one is, is a positive semi-definite matrix and this one is a positive semi-definite matrix, then all of the, all of the <coughs> positive semi-definite matrices that can be made by a convex combination of those are also positive semi-definite. And the set of positive semi-definite matrices is a convex set. Just like the pictures I, I showed you before. It's, it's easy to see that if you have G1, G1 greater than or equal to zero is and G2 equal to zero, that implies that um, alpha G1 plus one minus alpha G2 must also be greater than or equal to zero for all alpha in zero to one. You can just plug that directly in because this says that X transpose G1 X greater than zero for all x. This one says x transpose g2, x is greater than equal to zero. So by just multiplying this around, I can say that, well, alpha, positive alpha times that is also gonna be good. This one's also gonna be good. And adding them together just gives me this, okay? So the set of positive semi-definite matrices is a convex set. And in practice, if you ask a modern optimization solver that knows how to talk about semi-definite constraints, if you just say, I'd like it to, to have an optimization problem and some of my decision variables have this property that they must, be, they must assemble themselves into a positive semi-definite matrix, then that's something that a convex optimization solver can handle. Okay. 
Yes. Good, good. So um, that's a really good question. Even, so even in this example, I could answer that question. Right, this one's easier to think about. Okay. So far, I just listed a bunch of constraints. You're right. Um, I could have left it alone, and it would have found me some Lyapunov function. Uh, but it, I tend to not do that because I'd like to take. A, I'd like to have an opinion rather than have the solver sort of tell me, "Yeah, I picked anything." I just like. Of all this, the possible Lyapunov functions, there's some I like more than others. So what I did is I put an objective in which said um, minimize the sum over i of v dot x i minus 1 squared. I think maybe I even made it a quadratic program. Why did I pick that? That means like if all other things equal, make the Lyapunov function look about like the cost, the time to go, minimum time problem. It was just kind of a way to put a scaling in. I, the result would have been the same if I hadn't put that in, but it, it would offend my optimization brain. I think this is a slightly, it's, it's nicer to just fully specify the problem. So I put that in as a natural scaling. But the Lyapunov conditions do not require that. It's just kind of helps the optimizer uh, know what I want. Does this kind of make sense? Only at a level of abstraction. I've only given you this level of abstraction. So I, you're going to be able to say some of my decision variables are a positive 70, must form a positive 70 de definite matrix. So that'll help me write basis, you know, conditions for V at least to be positive. Yes? I see. Or as negative as possible? Yeah, that's a great question. So why did I not just say v dot be as small as possible, race downhill as quickly as possible? Um, there are, fun so I, I, I probably could have done that in this case because I set v to be one somewhere. But somewhere you want to avoid the fact that infinitely steep Lyapunov functions are, are valid Lyapunov functions, which would be numerically bad to ask the solver for, right? So I, I, I probably put two safeguards in. I put this one and the setting V to be one at some place. But that was what I was trying to avoid. And then this, like, this obviously wouldn't have produced such a nice example. That's um, right. But I guess you're saying like that the overall behavior is going to be the same, so you don't gain that much by making it more negative? Or uh, that's true. So the, the condition, so just to repeat it for the, the camera, but uh, right, so so. It would, I would have been no better. If my definition is just proving that it is a Lyapunov function, true or false. So finding a steeper one wouldn't have actually been better by that definition. OK, so you can imagine changing that first for all xi. I want to make sure this point lands, right? This was a bunch of sampled points, okay? If instead of writing at a bunch of xi's, v is greater than or equal to zero, I were to parameterize v like this and just add the, like this, and just add the constraint g is greater than or equal to zero, then that guarantees for all x, v is a positive definite function. No sampling required. Magic is starting to happen. No sampling required. It's just the magic of quadratic forms. It's kind of like not a new magic, but it's, it is magic, OK? The harder part, then, is how do I do v dot of x, right? Because v dot of x is going to take, it's going to have my dynamics in it, partial v, partial x, f of x. I don't get to control f of x. How do I make that happen to have a squared term or something like that? Okay, now here's a trick, it's, and this one, uh, it's just, when you see it, it makes sense. Okay, I don't know how to make it seem like the obviously right thing to do, but.
turns out, let me just write this as some sort of arbitrary polynomial. Okay, I'm just using p for polynomial. I haven't parameterized this ahead of time to be sort of out of the box positive, but I can put constraints on it using exactly that same trick. Here's how I'm going to do it, okay? I'm going to put extra constraints saying p of x equals some other basis function times g, I'll call it g2 of x, m of x. g2 greater than or equal to 0. OK, so let's just think what happened here. I've got a, I've got a arbitrary function that came in. I want to potentially search over that function, but have it be guaranteed for all x to be positive. One way to do that is to say it must equal some function constructed by out of the box to be positive. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that I can make that equality, even though it's over functions, happen with a finite set of linear constraints in the specific case of p being a polynomial. Okay. Okay, so here's just an example. If I wanted to say p of x equals you know, 1 plus 2x squared and ask, is this greater than or equal to 0, okay, you immediately say yes. That's, this is positive. For all x, this is positive. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, uh, for sure, yes. So in this case, let me say, I'll put a negative there just to keep the rest of it clean. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this one is, is positive out of the box. It could have been written in that form. Okay, here's a slightly more interesting one. What if I said p of x is 2 minus 4x plus 5x squared and ask you, is that positive for all x? OK. It's harder to answer, but I can convince you that there's an answer by writing the matrix 1x x squared times some g here. OK. 1x x squared. This is going to be g11, g12, g13, okay, so on. We'll have the coefficients. If g is positive definite, okay, and if this equality holds, then of course, then I, I think I could have convinced you, right? What's amazing is that for polynomials, the coefficient matching is linear and can be written as linear constraints, and it's sufficient. Okay, so what, if I want to say this is equal to this, then I can do that by finding all the terms that are constant, which in this case is just g11. It must equal 2. Okay, if I collect all of the terms that are like g12 plus g21, that has to be equal negative 4. Okay, if I collect all this, the squared terms, I get something equals 5. These are each linear constraints on the decision variables here. If I can find a matrix G,
constrained to match this polynomial such that G is positive semi-definite, then this must have been positive. Okay? So the way I'm going to prove this is positive is write a different one that is by construction positive and show that they're equal. This is called sums of squares decomposition of a polynomial, okay? And in general, optimizing over polynomials using this trick is called sums of squares optimization. Is that trick kind of clear? Okay, so yes, so Sava's so exactly right. The way I will then add extra constraints is I will take the derivative of my basis functions here, multiply by f. If f is polynomial, which it was for the, the it was polynomial in theta, in, in cosine theta, sine theta, and theta dot, okay, but more, we'll, we'll see some that are even simpler. You don't even have to worry about the sine and cosine yet, okay. If this thing is polynomial, then I can use this trick. Yes? It's a deep question. The question was, why are we looking for g, not the square root of g? Um, if this was the square root of g, if you wanted to look for g transpose g, then that would be true by, by construction. But the, the constraints would now be bilinear and non-convex in g. Right, so the coefficient matching would, would have g, g1 times g3 or something here. And those would be harder constraints to deal with. Having said that, some people do do that. Some, there's there's uh, some scalable approaches to semi-definite programming which actually go ahead and write that, uh, the Chovasky factorization of the matrix and try to do gradient descent in that. Okay, but I think for the level of detail today, it's, it's better to think of it like this. Yes? Sorry, it's, it's the G is a positive definite matrix mm -hmm. or positive semi-definite when I write greater than or equal to, okay? So this, the constraints of a positive semi-definite matrix based on its determinant or based on whatever are, are potentially convex or complicated constraints, but they form a convex set and we have written special purpose solvers that know how to optimize over the class of semi-definite uh, matrices, yeah. That make sense? Okay, so let me show you um, even an even simpler version of sort of all this, um, which is gonna make everything, everything work and everything nice. Let's do Lyapunov analysis using this kind of trick for linear systems, okay? Just to exercise the machinery and because it's actually a really good tool to know. So let's say we have x dot equals a of x, and I want to prove that a is stable, okay? Is it stable? I want to do that by finding the op, I mean, I could take eigenvalues, okay? But we're not going to do that this time because we're going to, because the optimization way to check if this matrix is stable um, would be an inefficient way to test this one system, but it's gonna be much more general. Okay, so how, how do I prove this is stable in the optimization way? I'm gonna write, a, I'm gonna search over Lyapunov functions that look like this, okay? 
I'll choose p strictly greater than 0. Positive definite matrix. V dot then, using your, um, your our, our practiced sort of gradients of matri matrices, is going to be x transpose a transpose p x plus x transpose p a x. And I want this to be strictly less than 0. This thing can be rewritten as just a matrix. If I, could, if I factor that out to just right, it's equivalent to saying that the matrix Uh, is less than zero. Okay, so this is a function of x, but it turns out if the matrix here is negative definite, that's equivalent to the function being negative definite. Okay, so the optimization of the problem I can write is find me a p, no objective right now, find me a p such that p is positive definite and um, P dot, and the v dot, which is this thing, is negative definite. The way I will actually tell the solver how to do this, because this is now um, a more, this is not a uh, semi-definite constraint by its, right out of the box, but I can make P2 by the way, this happened because P is uh, symmetric, right? You could, you could have written P transpose here, but the reason, but P is symmetric for positive definite matrices. Okay, I'm going to say this is equal to P2, and P2 is, or I'll say negative P2, and then I'll say P2 is greater than or equal to zero. Same trick I did here. This is just in the matrix case. Find me a different quadratic form. Okay, and I'll just... This is a bunch of linear constraints on the, on the elements of P to make those, those match. Is that okay? Lots of linear constraints, one per element, plus a po one positive definite constraint. Okay, this is an equivalent way to write the problem I wanted, which is that V is greater than zero and V dot is, greater, is less than zero. If you can find me a P that satisfies this, then I've proven my linear system is is stable. Yes? Are these strict inequalities also end with minus zero because they're probably due to some small epsilon? Yes. Okay. If I want strict if I want the strict, then I would I would ask the semi definite programming to be greater than epsilon x squared or something. So if you if you have a system that is sort of yes it is greater than zero but it's smaller than epsilon x squared, is there sort of nothing you can do besides increasing your precision? Right, so I mean, um, if I just asked for semi-definite matrix, then I would have a uh, stable in the sense of Lyapunov, which for a linear system would mean, could be marginally stable system could be stable in the sense of Lyapunov, right? So all the conditions work if you ask for uh, less than or equal to zero. If you want asymptotic stability, then you ask for epsilon, and yes, you have to, you have to pick some arbitrarily small epsilon, sufficiently small epsilon, yeah. But if you're in the realm where like epsilon you know, 0.001 doesn't work well, then you're probably unhappy anyways. I've never felt frustrated by that, by picking epsilon. Okay, so does this kind of make sense? That's just matrix equations, but it's a way to, to hand, to turn our Lyapunov functions, which gained more complexity by going through the dynamics, but then turning it back into, again, a simple or semi-definite semi construction. Uh, constraint with linear constraints. And in general, a asking for any linear combination of matrices to be positive, semi-definite, or, po or negative semi-definite, those are called linear matrix inequalities, and those are all something you can do this trick for.
Okay, the reason to do this, again, if you just had one matrix A and you wanted to ask if it's stable, just take the eigenvalues and check the eigenvalues are, you know, okay. This is a harder way to do it, but this is a more general way to do it, and let me convince you of that. A few of you have asked a few times about robustness, okay? If I want to talk about robust stability, it's hard to do that on the eigenvalues, but it's natural to do it here. Okay, so let me do a simple example of robust stability. Using semi-definite programming. So robust stability gets into the space of saying, I don't know what the A matrix is, but I want to put some bounds on what the A matrix could be. If I say A is arbitrary, then the answer is just no, your system's not stable, okay? So you have to come up with some class of, of dynamics that you want to ask, you know, this is my quadrotors dynamics linearized, plus or minus the mass of the, you know, there's some uncertain parameters that you have, right? Maybe the wind is blowing, there's different ways that you could, you could factor in and come up with slightly different A matrices to describe a class of systems, okay? So I wanna go from x dot equals ax to something that's got some uncertainty over the parameters. And the way we're gonna, there's many ways to do that. I just make, made a choice that makes the, the board work clean, but we could, we could put it on you know, elements of the mass or the lengths or whatever, um, and it would work out to be the same. But let me just say that a is um, composed, is some linear combination of some other A matrices, some convex combination. I'll show you what I mean by this in a second. Okay, so I mean the picture in A space is I've got some, you know, it might be this system it might be this system, it might be this system, I don't really know. I can pick a bunch of systems it might be, and I'm gonna say that the real system is just in the convex hull of these different A matrices I picked, right? That would be a way to say, I don't really know what A is, but it's, you know, it's somewhere between these different A's that I, that I think, right? So I could linearize the quadrotor dynamics once with the mass equals 10, one with it equals seven, you know, I could have the wind be something, I could have whatever, right? And I'll say, those are all reasonable things. I know the real quadrotors dynamics is somewhere in the convex hull of those different linearizations. Okay. So here's a cool modification of what we just wrote that would prove that for all of these A's, the system is stable. If you can find me a P, such that, you know, that P is greater than or equal to zero, or I'll say strictly greater, just for, for good. I'm still using my V of X is the quadratic form. Find me a P where this is true, and for all I, P A I transpose plus um, I'm sorry, I wrote it, well, that, either one will P, A, I, plus A, I, transpose P, is less than zero. Okay. Using the work we've done so far in the lecture, you could see how this is again just a linear set of equations, and if I want to put the 
the constraint that it's a semi-definite program, then for each i, for each possible model, I'll make a new decision variable, extra p. I'll set that that decision variable's got to be positive definite, and I'll put linear constraints making it match. Okay? If I can find a p, a single p, that is going downhill for all the systems, what is this saying, right? This is saying that for all x, no matter which a it is, I'm going to go downhill for any of the a's inside that, right? The way to see that is that if this is true, then certainly this is also true. If this is true here, with a little bit of math, this is, uh, this is also true, that the convex that anything in the convex hull is also going downhill. So that's finding a common Lyapunov function. One Lyapunov function works for all of these different systems, and that actually proves that anything in between also works. Yeah? Did you ever use the assumption that the beta i sum to one, or would any positive com combination? Uh, we do use that, that here. Um, Right, does that, would that hold if beta i was allowed to be greater than one? <coughs> I guess. Yeah, maybe there's a more general version. Yeah, okay, good call. Okay, so, let me just do a little, just to show you how, how naturally this works. Super small semi-definite program that si finds common Lyapunov functions, okay? So I'm going to generate random stable matrices, okay? I can pick a different number of states. I can pick different number of systems, okay? I'm just going to pick random stable matrices. That's a really bad way to do it, right? Because it's not clear that even if they're all stable, it's not clear that the convex hull of those is going to be stable. So this optimization will succeed sometimes, it will fail sometimes. But when it succeeds, it says that those collection of stable matrices and their convex hull is actually stable, okay? So all that work up here is just generating random matrices to make my problem, okay? But it really is just make a mathematical program Make a new symmetric continuous variables P, add a constraint that P is strictly positive. You see the 0 .0, 0 0.01, okay? And then the negative AI, the dot there is dot product, not P dot, okay? But uh, yeah, so this is, this is just saying exactly this equation for all I. You can hand it to the solver almost like that. I put an objective in because it offends me not to, but I don't, didn't really need to. It just gives me a better uh, numerics, okay? And I find some system that, that not only does, um, are the eigenvalues of P positive, okay? That's what I wanted. And the eigenvalues of P dot are negative, so it finds the solution, and it found a common Lyapunov function for those two systems. Okay, if I run this 10 times, it'll fail sometimes. Could not find a Lyapunov function. This is expected to occur with some probability. Okay? But it's like super fast optimization for robust stability. Convex optimization. When it fails, when it does fail, that, by the way, that means in the land of convex optimization, that means there is no solution to the problem you asked. There is no quadratic common Lyapunov function for those systems. And again, we're operating in the land of quadratic forms. We're not sampling over X. Everything today, you know, after we got into the quadratic form is for all X.
Okay, so um, let's just do a, another. So uh, here's a couple of the nonlinear versions of this, right? The same trick that I wrote up before using the sums of squares, okay, allows me to now search over, or first certify, but then search over Lyapunov functions, even for polynomial dynamics. Okay, so here's a, uh, I said f, which is my x dot, is just some polynomial function. It's x dot, I have x1 dot equals negative x1 minus 2x squared. Okay, x2 dot equals negative x2 minus x1, x2 minus 2, x2 cubed, okay? Just some weird polynomial dynamics in two variables. Find me a Lyapunov function that certifies that optimality. I can do that by writing v of x is some linear function of this, you know, but I'm going to actually write it as a where these are just the polynomial coefficients. These are the, my monomial basis. It'll be like 1 uh, x1, x2, x1, x2, x1 squared, x2 squared. Super generic. Okay. For this, find me a g so that this is true and partial, you know, v dot of x is less than or zero by finding another one here that matches the coefficients and is strictly negative. I'll do this version of it. Nice. Forgot to run the first cell. Okay, so f, it says v, make me a new sums of squares polynomial. That's the way that we ask for, come up with, with this, okay? All I tell it about is the number of the variables and what degree I want. I say go up to degree 2 in these variables. Okay, it'll print out the candidate, and then I say add um, a linear constraint just to peg v0 to be 0 and v some arbitrary v1 to be 1, just to set a scale. I compute v dot by taking symbolic gradients, actually taking the derivatives of that equation, and then I add a sums of squares constraint saying v dot is less than or 0. That one line constructs a new decision variable like this, makes the basis, and tries to, and adds a semi-definite constraint. And boom, the candidate it searched over is Lyapunov functions of this form, right? That's just written out this as a, as a scalar, okay? And it found a solution which is basically x0 squared plus uh, 2x1 squared. And you can verify that with pencil and paper. If you just make that 1 and 2, the strict coefficients, then that's absolutely a Lyapunov function of this. Questions? Is the, are the implications clear? I know the, that we'll, it'll, we'll, we'll go through the machinery more and more, okay? But the big thing that happened was we changed from sampling, which was a totally reasonable thing, to saying I'm going to parameterize quadratic forms. And if I want to pick an arbitrary function, you know, a polynomial function, and ask if it's positive, a way to do it is to make it equal to a parameterized quadratic form. In the case of polynomials, that's something we can do. We just match the coefficients. If, if this was a neural network, and I said I wanted to prove that this was um, positive, I don't know how to, I could write positive neural networks. I could just take any neural network, square its outputs, and that would definitely be a positive function. But I can't do that extra step of saying this neural network equals this neural network by just checking a finite number of linear constraints. That would be really cool if I could. Can't do that. But for polynomials, we can do that. Okay? 
So in this case, we have really nice optimizations that search over Lyapunov functions. It turns out, yeah, we'll, we'll explore the space. It gets more interesting if you don't have to search, if you can't find a global Lyapunov function, but you have to just find a, use a Lyapunov function to prove a region of attraction. That's going to fit in here, too. If you want to optimize control while searching for a Lyapunov function, we're going to have versions of that, too. But this is the basic machinery. Yes? Um, are there systems for which uh, Lyapunov function does exist, but this method is not in the class of this one? Is OK, very, very good question. So the question was, specifically what the question was, are there systems, even, let's say, polynomial systems, we'll restrict that, that have Lyapunov functions that do exist that can't be found with this method? Yes. OK? And there's, met, there's a, a handful of gaps. So everything I said was sufficient, but not necessary. OK. First gap, it turns out that polynomial, stable polynomial systems don't necessarily have polynomial Lyapunov functions that prove their stability. It might be that you have, need something more than a polynomial to prove that a polynomial system is stable. Okay. Second, there are positive polynomials that cannot be written as a sum of squares. Not every positive polynomial, well, it, in, in certain cases, in univariate cases, and there's a few cases where every positive polynomial has a sum of squares, okay? But there are problem, there are reasonable problems where a sums of squares polynomial, that a positive polynomial may not be decomposable into a sum of squares, okay? People have written research papers and named these polynomials. Sometimes they're hard to find in, in moderate dimensions, like the Motzkin polynomial is a famous one that's uh, fairly small but is, cannot be written as a sum of squares. Turns out if you go to, like, as you go to the limit of infinite dimensions, there's many of them. But the reason that doesn't seem to matter, in, uh, it, it hasn't been a stopping uh, point in this sort of line of work, is that there are many Lyapunov functions that can prove stability, typically. So even though every Lyapunov function that could potentially prove stability might not be sums of squares, there tends to be some Lyapunov function that can prove stability that is sums of squares. Yeah? Good. Yes, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you could do that right here, right? Uh, well, linear systems are going to be exponentially stable already, but um, but we would have v dot is less than v of x. V dot is a big polynomial. V of x, alpha times v of x or something is a polynomial, so that you can still use the same machinery. The same way, the same way we asked for epsilon x squared, you could just ask for epsilon v squared or v to go downhill, and that would work. Good question. Yeah. But for large scale SDP, isn't that but this gets this side is like kind of fast to solve a word, like it's very large. Okay. Scalable. Yeah, so there's a question about scalability, right? So in the zoo of convex optimizations, linear programs scale like enormous sizes. Quadratic programs a little less, you know, but still pretty big. Semi definite programs are not in the same class as those other solvers. They they tend to the solvers tend to um, take a long time, take a lot of memory, and potentially have numerical issues if you, as you get really large scale. So, you know, we've been able to do this for Atlas balancing on its toe, that one. That was a, we were able to do it for the linearization of that, showing that it was a, uh, finding a region of attraction for the nonlinear system. But that's about as big as we've done it so far. So, you know, up to ish, Atlas-ish scales, we've been able to use this sort of Lyapunov machinery. But beyond that, it gets, and there's other places where it gets hard. Uh, no, not real, not online, not online. Yeah, a quadratic program you could solve potentially on the fly. The sums of squares programs we tend to solve offline. Yeah. Yes. What degree of polynomials would you need for the Atlas system? I don't remember, but I could look. Yeah, I know that it's got seventy-three degrees.